guys, this is Coach Ross World History, and today we're going to be talking about the Cold War. Now, I know you're thinking we just got done with World War I and World War II. There's only so much trench foot that you guys can take. However, the Cold War was a little bit different because it was considered to be an ideological war. Historians disagree about when exactly the Cold War started. Some say it was during the Yalta Conference when Stalin was not wanting to allow free elections to take place in Eastern Europe. Others say it happened at the Tehran Conference when Truman found out about the successful detonation of the nuclear bomb at Alamogordo, New Mexico. Now, now, truth be told, Stalin actually probably knew about it before because he had a spy inside the Manhattan Project. So having a spy in your so-called allies' top secret nuclear program seems pretty Cold war to me. But about five minutes after World War II ended, the Cold War officially began. General George S. Patton actually advocated for the United States to immediately fight the Soviet Union, claiming it would only take his third army six weeks to defeat the Soviets. But if the U.S. waited, it would take six years and cost six million lives. So prior to the end of the war, it was decided that Germany would be divided among the allied nations, the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Each country would control one-fourth of the country. Additionally, they would control a portion of the city of Berlin, which as you can see is within the Soviet sphere of Germany. <clears throat> so as I stated before, the Cold War was an ideological struggle. The United States wanted to do the following things. One, promote democratic governments and capitalist economies throughout the world and stop the spread of communism. Two, rebuild war-torn Europe. You see, the idea was that if the United States gave massive amounts of economic aid to Western European governments, they would be less likely to fall to communism. It was also, you know, like a humanitarian effort. And this was known as the Marshall Plan for a formal general and then Secretary of State George Marshall. Three, reunite and stabilize Germany. The so Soviet Union's goals were the following. One, to encourage the spread of communism to other parts of the world. Two, rebuild its war-torn cities and industries within the Soviet Union. Three, control Eastern European countries in order to create a buffer zone between themselves and the democratic West. Now, many Americans were unaware of what was going on in Europe. The United States had not suffered the devastation of the most deadly war in human history. American cities were not the, where the battles were fought. Additionally, after the war ended, the United States found itself to be the most powerful country in the world with a booming economy. They were removed, unaware of what was going on in the European crisis. To wake Americans up, former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill made a speech in Missouri stating that an iron curtain has descended upon Europe because nothing scares Missourians more than a Soviet Iron Curtain. So, in Berlin, which was technically a city in the Soviet sphere of Germany, it was split into East and West Berlin. Stalin started a blockade of the city. The idea was to starve out the capitalist West Berliners in order to get them to succumb to communism. In response, the Allies dropped supplies to citizens for 11 months in order to keep West Berlin from falling to communism. Next, Stalin started to create a buffer zone between the Soviet Union and Western Europe. Now, at the Yalta Conference, Stalin had agreed that he would allow free elections in Eastern Europe. However, Churchill had predicted that he would only allow them if those countries voted for communist governments. Those free elections in Eastern Europe became a lot less free when they had voted for democracy, and one by one the countries of Eastern Europe fell to communist rule, heavily influenced by the Soviet Union. This was called the domino theory, which is the idea that if you let one country fall to communism, then the countries immediately surrounding that country would be at a greater risk to fall to communism. The domino theory would form the basis of U.S. foreign policy for the next several decades and what would be referred to as containment. It was the idea that you couldn't directly become involved in a war with the Soviet Union, so your next best move was to stop the spread of communism. This was something that was difficult to do. The West was able to make sure that communism didn't spread into Western Europe. However, within a few years, all of Eastern Europe China, Korea, and Vietnam were under communist control. So the idea of containment was a lot like a chess game. With the world being the chessboard, each side was trying to strategically position itself in a way to defeat each other. I know what you're thinking. Coach Ross, you're a football coach. You don't know how to play chess or care about strategy. Well, I don't appreciate being pigeonholed. And moreover, I'll have you know that you are looking at the 7th and 8th grade Cross Timbers Middle School Chess Champion. Boom! Yeah, I can't believe that I just said that allowed on the internet. So if you're thinking why didn't the United States and Soviet Union just go to war instead of all the sneaking around and strategy stuff, it's because in 1949 the Soviet Union had their first successful nuclear test. Now this was an issue. See the United States liked being the only nuclear power and now that our arch enemy controlled the same destructive technology to destroy the world, you know, 
it was a little disconcerting. So, in response to the two major adversaries having the same capability to destroy the world many times over, they agreed on a policy called MAD. MAD stood for Mutually Assured Destruction, and the idea was predicated on the belief that both sides are rational thinkers, and that in the event of one side attacking the other with a nuclear strike, the defending side would pretty much launch all their nuclear bombs, assuring the end of the world. I know it sounds crazy, but think about it. If the stakes are so high that any mishap assures the entire Earth is destroyed, it creates a pretty good incentive not to use nuclear weapons, assuming both sides are rational. Thankfully they were, however we did come extremely close to nuclear war on more than one occasion. Now another part of the Cold War was the space race. It was launched in 1957 when the Soviets successfully launched Sputnik. Sputnik was the first artificial satellite with an elliptical orbit around the Earth, and the only thing it really did was make a beeping noise, but it scared Americans. So after this, you see the creation of NASA and President Kennedy promising that the United States would land on the moon at the end of the decade, and it started the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. Also, the Cold War was defined by a series of proxy wars. Now, a proxy war is when you have two sides that don't directly fight each other, but they support people who do. So in other words, in Korea, the United States was fighting against the Korean, the communist Korean government. The communist Korean government was being supported by communist China and Soviet Russia. And that happened again in Vietnam. And we did the same thing against the Soviet Union when they invaded Afghanistan in the 1980s. We supplied the Mujahideen with weapons uh, in order to resist the Russians. So that's all I have for you guys today. We're going to cover the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War later on in the unit. So please make sure that you follow me on Twitter. Also make sure you check out my website. Uh, just Google Coach Ross World History and it's the first thing that pops up. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. 